The word says, let the children sing a song of liberation. The God of our salvation will set us free. Let's sing it together. Lord, we can't help but praise you this morning. You are worthy of our praise, and we lift our hearts and our minds and our thoughts towards you. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint this service today. We pray, Lord, that you would anoint our pastors. He opens the word of God. We pray, Lord, for our musicians, for our vocalists. I pray, Lord, your anointing will be upon the music as we worship together in this holy place. Lord, we desire more than anything just to be used of you. And we've come here to be equipped and empowered and encouraged to do the work that you've called us to do. Help us to do it well. And we pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. I encourage you to reach forward, grab one of those Connect cards. If there's a prayer request, a need that you have, you can place that on the card. 
And we just appreciate having that information and, and knowing how to pray for you. At the end of the service, we receive our regular tithes, our offerings, and our faith promise gifts for missions. You can just drop that in the offering plate as well as that welcome card. And we encourage you in that regard. On July 7th, we are going to have a special celebration service here at uh, Grace Point. But it'll be one service at 1045. So mark your calendars. Remember that we'll only have one service on July 7th. There'll be no Sunday school on that day. And we'll have um, a nursery for infants two years of age and under. So just plan on that. Uh, you might have noticed that the parking lot was striped over the weekend. And we're excited about that. Uh, and, and we've created two drop-off areas on each side of the main entrance. And that's so that uh, you can kind of get in and get out. Uh, some of our seniors have a hard time because of the slope right there at that uh, overhang, and it's difficult to get in and out. And so we've created a couple zones to make that a little easier. And so if you're not parking there, that'd be great. It says drop off only. That's what that means, <laughs> drop off only. I wanna give you a quick testimony. A couple friends of mine, Pete and Sharon Aulis, they went to go visit uh, Ben's uh, graveside yesterday. And while there at the cemetery, they met with the director of the cemetery and he went to our vacation Bible school. Now, Steve, and you might now find the rest of the story as I tell the story. They came to the vacation Bible school and um, he said, man, I was just overwhelmed. There was a hundred volunteers working. He said there was one volunteer for every, uh, yeah, one volunteer for every two children that were there. He said, I was so overwhelmed. I was so impressed. I couldn't believe the church had that many volunteers. And then he said, you know, I was so impressed that I wanted to be a part of their mission project and their mission offering. And so I wrote a check. And, uh, and so Stephen, that's that check that that young man said, hey, I got X amount of dollars for the offering today. And Stephen thought, oh yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, your involvement speaks volumes to the community. When you're engaged, when you're here, when you show up, that speaks volumes to the community. And I just wanted to say thank you and thank you for a job well done. We've got a project coming up this August. It's kind of a community outreach. We'll let you know more about that. We're gonna need a lot of people involved and so we'll be recruiting you for that. But I want you to remember that. You know, sometimes we think, you know, why I'm only a helper. Well, only a helper makes a difference because it speaks volumes to the community. Isn't it great to be a part of the church? Let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord. Jesus, 
Your grace is sufficient for us all when we face oppressing trials, debilitating temptations, and even unpleasant emotional events. Thank you, Jesus, for that. God supplies us with as much grace as we need for every situation we face. Grace for facing illness, or financial need, grace for our lack of wisdom or lack of social skills, grace for dealing with rebellious children or aging parents. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with a sinner's You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise. Peace. 
people remember your children remember your promise oh god your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough Amen. You may be seated. Aren't you glad that the grace of God is more than enough for whatever it is that we find ourselves, wherever we find ourselves, whatever situation we find ourselves in? I found myself in a situation this week. Um, we went to Cedar Point with the teens this week. Um, I don't know if any of you remember um, what this week was like weather-wise. Um, but we found ourselves at Cedar Point, and it was 90 hot, 90-something. 90 it was just, just plain hot. And as we were at Cedar Point, and it was hot, I don't know if I mentioned that, but we were on the asphalt jungle, and from the asphalt, you could see the heat emanate from, and it was dry. And it was hot, if I could repeat that again. Um, but it was kind of amazing as we waited for rides in the sun as it baked us and we were just dry. And at about 3.30, the rides begin to shut down. And there was a weather delay. We hadn't seen any rain or the chance of rain. But as the rides began to shut down, there was hope. Of rain yeah and then eventually the rain came the rain came and it just blanketed the park with a shower that was a release from the heat and the dryness that we had felt all day yeah God does that for us not at Cedar Point but he does that in our lives. He does that in our lives because he is a good and faithful father. And so I don't know where you find yourself today, whether uh, you're on the mountaintop and the grass is green and lush, or you're in, the, in the, the heat of your spiritual life where things are dry and kind of crusty. But the rain of the Spirit can soothe and bring to life wherever you find yourself. We're going to continue in worship with this song. Sing along, listen to the words, but just know we serve an amazing God who cares.
see the barren desert So bleak and obsolete A place where nothing really grows They perish from the heat But there's a strange wind blowing A distant thunder rolls And storm clouds gather overhead As lightning strikes the soul Pray for rain When your heart is dry and thirsty Pray for rain When your life is void and empty Pray for rain When you don't know what to pray So bleak and obsolete It's a place where nothing really grows They perish from the heat Oh, but there's a strange wind blowing A distant thunder rolls And those storm clouds, they gather overhead As lightning strikes the Pray for rain When your life is void and empty Pray for rain When you don't know what to pray Pray for rain Pray for rain When your heart I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in the whole creation will able to separate us from the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you.
Pastor Edgar and the team's leadership here to just present this moment that I think we can just share with the Lord. And so, if that's you, if, if you need Him, um, I invite you to just bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and I want to pray a blessing over you that Jesus taught. And there are many ways for us to be in need. And so if you find yourself in any of these categories, would you just receive what Jesus has for you? For those who are poor in spirit, Jesus said, may you be blessed and may you know that what is yours is the kingdom of heaven. And for those who mourn today, May you know that Jesus has called you blessed and may you be comforted today. For those who are gentle even in difficult and trying circumstances, may you be blessed and know that you, the gentle, shall inherit the earth. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, may you know that you are blessed by Jesus so that you will be satisfied. If you have demonstrated mercy, 
to those who may not deserve it. May you be blessed by Jesus today and receive his mercy that is great in size and perpetuity. For the pure in heart, may you be blessed today and know that it's the pure in heart that shall see the Lord. For those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, know that Jesus has called you blessed and know that you, what is yours is the kingdom of heaven. For those who've been insulted and persecuted against and people have lied about you, know that you are blessed by Jesus today. Jesus, we just rejoice and are glad in the truth that you can take our needs demonstrate your goodness, but also take these situations and turn them for our good. You, Lord, are most worthy of our praise. And we receive whatever it is that you have for us in this place of need. Lord, you're good. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Um, okay. I, I'm going to go ahead and preach what I preached in first service. Is that okay? Because what I preached in first service wasn't necessarily what I had planned to preach earlier this week. Um, and I texted Pastor Edgar yesterday afternoon, and I said, I'm calling an audible again, and I'm going to preach a different message um, tomorrow morning, today. So um, I, I believe it's the word of the Lord for us, and, and uh, I am going to stay in the sermon series that we're in, God Is. And, uh, and so we have, for the last two weeks, heard uh, different attributes and, and different characteristics of God's essence and nature. And so in week one of this series, we learned that God is a consuming fire. Remember that? And if God is a consuming fire, then I believe His desire is for His children to be on fire. What we call on fire and what we think of as these like high moments of spirituality, God calls being spiritually healthy. If he's on fire, then his children should be on fire. So that was week one. Week two, we learned that God is Father. Last week on Father's Day, we were reminded that, you know, in spite of, at times, earthly fathers not being good examples, or in, even if we had good earthly fathers, we learned that God is a perfect and good Father, and that He has not only justified and regenerated us, He has actually adopted us into His family. Even if it was undeserved, He is counted us and included us as co-heirs with his son, Christ Jesus. Everybody say, wow. Like, did you forget that it is an amazing thing to have been included into God's family? You're co-heir with Christ Jesus. So, uh, we're going through this series this summer, I, I think, because it, it is extremely important that we know many of the characteristics and natures and, and the essence of the God that we love, adore, serve, and follow. It was A.W. Tozer who said, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. And so if our thinking about God is incorrect or smaller than it should be, then that would affect the life that we live and our relationship with Him. So today, I want to talk to you about another essence, nature, characteristic of God that is the most mentioned characteristic of God throughout all of Scripture. And I'm wondering, 
if you would know that. I, I, I like to ask for participation, but at the same time, I don't want someone to shout out a wrong answer and then them feel embarrassed. Uh, because I did that in Bible school this week, uh, last week. Uh, Krista was teaching the Bible, Deep Bible Adventure, and she asked a question, and I was like, yes, and the answer was no. <laughs> and I said it so enthusiastically, I was like, whoops. <laughs> Um, so, what do you think is the most referenced characteristic of God throughout all the Bible? Love is what first service said, and, and, and it's not love. Miss Jan Rainey, I think, said it. It's holiness. Whoever said it, it's actually holiness. It, it's the word holy. Did you know that the word holy appears in the Bible over 630 times? It appears even more than love, and love appears somewhere in like the 550 time range. The word holy is the most used and chief descriptor of who God is. Now, holy and holiness is a word that we have a lot of associations and connotations with. Sometimes we think we understand it, and other times we're like, I don't have a clue what that means. But in a denomination that considers ourselves to be in the holiness church, I guess my question for us today is, do we still believe in holiness? Do we believe that God is holy? Yeah, that's not rhetorical. We're going to talk about it, but if, let me ask one more question. If He is holy, then should His people also be holy? That's 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. 1 Peter cites the commandment, be holy for I am holy. And so, this attribute of God, listen, we want God to be a lot of things, don't we? We want God to be provider. We want God to be savior. We want God to be uh, ever-present. We want God to be a lot of things. But listen, the Lord has prepared me to tell you today that he is holy because we need him to be holy. We want him to be a lot of things, but we need him to be this thing more than any other. Amen? Amen. And so, I want to preach to you the message that God is holy. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. And normally, I have you stand, um, but uh, we're, we're not going to stand because we're going to walk through these verses uh, through the whole sermon. But we'll just say it on the front end. We are approaching the Word of God with reverence. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I know that today you want to speak a word of grace and truth to your children. And Lord, I know that if you can use anyone, you can use me. I just pray from a posture and spirit of humility and desperation, seeking your anointing to preach your words today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So in Isaiah chapter 6, we are given a glimpse into the prophet Isaiah's life and encounter with the Lord. And so, we'll just start reading here, and we're just going to go through verse by verse. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, in verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, that is an easy phrase to kind of read past, but it really gives us a window into the context in which this encounter happens. You may read in the year of King Uzziah his death. You, you might not think much of it, but let me just stop and, and, uh, and, and share with you that King Uzziah was probably the most prosperous king since Solomon himself. Uh, he was the 10th king of God's people, and he took the throne at the ripe age of 16. You thought having a 38-year-old pastor was young. 
which it is. <laughs> uh, somebody in first service was telling me, like, I've got food in the refrigerator older than you. And <laughs> I just, I blessed him in Jesus' name because I don't get that as much as I used to. You know, 10 years ago, I used to get all the time, how are you a pastor? You're not even out of high school. I don't get that anymore, ever. So it was a blessing, right? So King Uzziah takes the throne at the age of 16, and he reigned for 52 years. He, he was known for his military prowess. The ki his kingdom expanded under his leadership. They were very prosperous. The, the, the kingdom just continued to become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And, and like for 52 years, God's people were able to just rely on King Uzziah. And then he dies. What do you think, if we're going to think out loud together, what would you think would be some of the emotions that the people felt when King Uzziah had died? Fear, wantedness, wantedness. like, uh, yeah, we're, okay, sad, we're going to get there, sad, uh, fearful, uncertain, say that again, grief, yeah, what else, loss, loss. Despair. despair, yeah. That, that's, I think, uh, wantedness, despair, fear. I, I think as a nation, the people were probably like, what in the world is going to happen? They had looked upon their, their earthly throne, and the one who sat on it was the same year after year after year. For 52 years, they had grown accustomed to this leader, and now all of a sudden, he's gone. They had to have been feeling unsettled and in a place of turmoil and, and just fear. And I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but we're in an election year. And there's a lot of those same emotions that we might be feeling. But I say all of that to say that the one Isaiah saw seated high and exalted on a throne was not the next king of Judah. The one he saw was a king who sat on a heavenly throne. And so in this place of fear and uncertainty, the Lord was trying to remind his people, no, look to me. And at all times in our lives, when we feel fear and uncertainty and this unsettledness and this despair, we are not to look to an earthly throne, but we are to look to heaven's throne. And we see the one who is seated high and exalted on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I mean, think of that, just the majesty of the beauty of the Lord where his train fills the temple. We get just a glimpse of that oftentimes on a bride's wedding day, and the, the train of her dress follows in behind her, and it's like this awe-inspiring moment, isn't it? And often and should leave the groom in tears, right, when he sees the bride coming down. Like when we look up, the beauty and majesty of the Lord fills the temple. Amen? In verse 2, above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings covered their faces, and with two their feet, and with two they were flying. So I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but the word seraphim, this is the only place in all of Scripture where the word seraphim appears. And it is translated literally as the burning ones. So I don't know... Um, I heard a word recently that God is a consuming fire. Anybody else? Is that ringing a bell? Anybody? God is a consuming fire. And so we have these six 
creatures who live in the presence of God, their name, how they are known, and how they are described are the burning ones. That should say something to us, right? As we come before the Lord in His presence, we should maybe be called the burning ones. Amen. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. They call to each other back and forth, and we know this also appears in Revelation, and I've preached from this before. In Revelation 4 and 5, John gives us a window into the throne room again, and of course, it's the same thing still occurring because it has occurred day and night since God started creation that these heavenly beings have been declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, six, over 636 times in the Word, God is called holy, but only twice in Scripture, Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4 and 5, only twice in Scripture is any essence or nature of God ever taken to the third degree. God is holy, and so much so, He's holy, holy, holy. R.C. Sproul, theologian, said this. I think I've got this quote on a slide. Um, Only once in sacred Scripture is an attribute of God elevated to the third degree. The Bible says that God is holy, 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 not that He's merely holy or even holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is love, love, love love, mercy, 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 wrath, 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 justice, 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 but it does say that He is holy, 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 and the whole earth is full of His glory. So this attribute and this this part of God's essence is taken to the third degree, and I want to say that that tells us that we may want God to be a lot of things, but what we need Him to be the most is holy. He is holy, holy, holy. And uh, the word holy, um, just to kind of explain, the word holy, what it means is is to be a cut above or to be separated from or just to be separated. Uh, An easy example is, of course, in the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we know that on the seventh day the Lord rested, and He set that part, that day apart, the Sabbath, and He called it holy. It's to be set apart for purpose, and it's to be set apart from. And so when we say that God is holy, 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 we're saying two things in that. One, we're saying that He is separated from what? Well, everything. God is separate from everything, and so that means that His essence and nature is not the same as the fallen world in which we live. We're saying His essence, number one, is that He is a morally pure God. And he cannot sin. And if he cannot sin, he cannot sin against you. And would somebody say amen to that? It makes him the most trustworthy being in all of creation because he cannot transgress against you. He's morally pure. He is perfect in all of his ways. And he is incorruptible. No matter the state of fallen creation, it will never change God's essence and nature. He will always be holy. He's so holy, in fact, He's holy, holy, holy. And in Hebrew, the reason it's repeated three times is so that everyone who will read this and hear this word will know, hey, don't miss this. He's holy, holy, holy. All you parents in here, can I ask you, have you ever repeated yourself to your children? Yes. Yeah, they, <laughs> well, that was a confession of a child or <laughs> well, uh, children. Um, yeah, they do. Why 
does a parrot have to repeat themselves? It's so that the message gets through. Eliza. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But you know that sometimes you have to say, clean your room. Clean your room. Clean your room. <laughs> now, the, it, in you know, the ancient language, the, it, the prophet Isaiah and the seraphim, they weren't saying he's holy, holy, holy. He's like, but they're trying to emphasize the fact this is not just another one of God's characteristics. This is who he is. He is holy holy. And part of that holiness is that he is perfect and morally pure. And the second part of what we mean when we say that God is holy, he's morally pure, but it also means that he is transcendent. He is separated from creation. Cre he is not a part of of creation. He is the one who sourced creation. Amen? He spoke it into being. He does not get his uh, essence from it. We get our essence from him. He stands outside of creation. So when we say that he's morally pure and, and that he's transcendent, what we're saying is like if we take 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The way we apply that is he's morally pure. We can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Then when we say he's transcendent, what we're saying is, and he can actually do something about them. He can actually do something about our anxieties and cares because he stands above all things. Come on. He is the transcendent God. In Exodus 15, 11, this is just after God had parted the Red Sea and Moses led the people through it. Moses writes this song, and in the song he says, who among all of creation is like our God? Come on, he is wonderful in his works. He is majestic in his holiness, and he is awesome in his deeds. Who among all of creation is like our God? So when we say he's transcendent, we're saying that our God has a wisdom that he did not have to learn. Our God has a strength that he didn't have to earn. And he has a love that he did not have to receive in order to give. So when we say that God is holy, we're saying who is like our God? Come on. Who is like our God, for he is holy, 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 and the whole earth is filled with his glory. Come on, isn't he good? So, verse four, the foundations of the thresholds. Let me read it in the NIV here. At the sound of their voices, the door posts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Here's another reference to fire, right? The whole temple was filled with smoke because God is a consuming fire. But it says, the, their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. Can I tell you that when you come into the presence of the one who is holy, 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 that it is a, an experience and an encounter that you can't begin to describe and you can't begin to put into words. All that you can say is that everything around you trembles at the majestic holiness and the awesome power and the wonderful works of the Lord. It says, at, and, and C.S. Lewis says it like this, how little people know if they think that holiness is dull. Because when one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. 
And that's why Grace Point, my prayer it ongoing is that Grace Point be a church where the presence of God dwells here in such measure that maybe even a, on a Sunday the doorpost might shake and the floor might tremble and the sanctuary be filled with smoke. And I probably need to clarify for Dr. Rex's sake, that doesn't mean we want you to cook spaghetti. (laughs) No, it means we want the presence of God to dwell here in such a way that He is irresistible to those who come here to seek Him. Amen? So, let's keep going. Verse 5. I got to get moving here. So all of this has happened, and now we see the prophet Isaiah's response. And boy, is it telling. In verse 5, Isaiah cries out, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Now in this encounter, God has not said anything yet, it's just The fact that he is holy, holy, holy has told the prophet Isaiah everything he needs to know, and everything he needs to know is he is unclean in comparison to God's holiness. And the response to being in God's holiness is true repentance. That's why my prayer is that God's presence dwell here in such a place because those who need to repent, if they come into God's presence, He will make it clear to them their need for heart cleansing and purifying. Amen? And so, I am a man of unclean lips. And this is powerful. It's a powerful word to me. Isaiah is a prophet of the Lord. For five chapters, he's been getting revelation and vision and a word from the Lord for five chapters. And we know that a prophet's job is to hear the word of the Lord and then speak the word of the Lord. So, in fact, the very best part of Isaiah would have been his lips. And Isaiah says in the presence of the one who is holy, 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 that the best thing about me is the first thing that I'm bringing to the Lord in repentance. Or is that just a powerful word to me because I'm a preacher? Like, does anyone else think, well, you know, there's a lot of things that I would repent of, but like, you know, the, they're all my weaknesses, they're all the things I'd change about myself. Did you know that in, before the presence of the one who's holy, 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 even the thing we consider best still needs to be cleansed, still needs to be purified? And, and Isaiah doesn't repent on behalf of the people before he repents for himself. And that's another really good word for us to hear is that when we come before the Lord, we're not repenting for all those other dirty, rotten sinners. We're repenting because even my best thing in comparison to his moral purity needs his cleansing. And so the way we apply that today is like stop trying to do things your way because your way isn't as good as his way. What you consider to be your strength and best still needs to be offered upon the altar to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Lord, this is the best thing about me, and yet I'm still needing you to make more of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. It was Billy Graham who said it like this, it's only when we understand the holiness of God will we understand the depth of our sin. Amen. Billy Graham could preach pretty good. I think there's something there that we all need to hear today. It it points and sheds light to the fact that God is holy, holy, holy holy. And we may want him to be all sorts of things, but the thing we need him to be is holy. 
We need him to be morally pure. We need him to be transcendent and stand outside of creation so that he can visit us in our places of captivity. He can visit us in a place of bondage and deliver us and set us free because what binds us does not bind him. What bothers us does not stress him out. What, what is an annoyance to us and, and what is always trying to come against us does not begin to sting him because he is the transcendent one. We need the Lord to come and do a work in us that we cannot do. And that's what we read if we go on in, in verses 6 and 7. We read that then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken uh, with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away from you and your sin is atoned for. Listen, God is holy, holy, holy. And he desires that we, 1 Peter 1, 16, we be holy for he is holy. In a holiness denomination, we have still got to believe that God can take coals from the altar, touch our lips, and make us like him. That because he's transcendent, he still has the power and ability to make us holy. And when we talk about holiness today, it's almost like got this negative connotation with it. Like, well, you know, I can't be holy because I've got this problem, this problem. And then, like, our language doesn't do us any favors either. We often um, speak of holiness like holy cow, holy smokes, holy moly. I don't know what a moly is, but may it be holy. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry, Lord. Like, because what if a moly is a bad thing? I don't know. <coughs> Anywho, uh, Lord, ah, touch my lips. <laughs> the burning coal. Okay, I'm sweating now. All right. But it's got this negative connotation. And like, we, we even use it in the negative when we refer to someone who's very serious about their relationship with the Lord. Don't we sometimes call those folks holy rollers? or holier than thou? Listen, when did we start using that language to refer to someone that we didn't want to be when if God is holy and he has commanded us to be holy for he's holy, when did we stop wanting to be made holy? And we cannot live in a time where holiness and holy becomes a taboo word as the church of the Nazarene, this is who we are. We believe that the one who's morally pure and is transcendent can step into our lives and touch us in such a way that it completely transforms our nature so that we're no longer who we used to be, but we become just like him. And if he used to do that, I want to say he can still do that. If he did it for the prophet Isaiah, I want him to do it for me. And goodness, I am so glad that my freedom doesn't depend upon me. I'm so glad that my freedom from sin and the sinful nature isn't dependent upon my works. I am so glad it just completely depends upon him. You know, in, in the church of the Nazarene, we, we used to be known as a people who would not do things and, and, and yeah, whatever. Okay, about to step in hot water again. Well, I'm just going to jump in. So, there used to be a time in the church when, like, ladies, you wouldn't wear makeup, jewelry, 
um, you would have to wear long sleeves. Guys would wear long sleeves. We used to be known as a church that would do that. And, of course, that's no longer a thing, partly because we realize that we don't make ourselves holy. Like, just because we wear certain clothes, that doesn't make us holy. Uh, the, there was an old evangelist in the church who uh, visited Princeton before I ever got there, probably before I was ever born, uh, and he was like this old-school Nazarene holiness evangelist. And uh, Princeton had a lady, um, the wife of, uh, goodness, this guy, I mean, was all but a founding member of the Church of the Nazarene in Princeton. He was the paper boy to the lady, Effie McDonald, who started the church. So Joe, Gar well, Joe Gardner had, I mean, seen the church through so many things. He basically paid the church's bills for years in the 80s. He kept the church open. His wife sold Avon in the 80s and 90s. You want to guess who she sold that makeup and jewelry to? All the ladies of the church. <laughs> and so this old school evangelist holiness preacher comes in, and he's looking around like every, all the ladies got on makeup, and so he gets up, and everyone's kind of like, whoa, what is this guy going to say? And um, Joe Gardner uh, told me, he was like, that guy got up in the pulpit, and he said, you know, I'm looking around, and I'm realizing a little pain on the barn never hurt anybody. <laughs> 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 uh, we used to be known as a very legalistic church at times. But thank the Lord, we've, we've come to understand just because we don't wear makeup, that doesn't make us holy. What makes us holy is if the Lord can take burning coals and touch our lips and our heart, and He purifies us in such a way that we become like Him. And the Lord just wants His people to be reminded that He'll still do that work today. In verse 8, you know, this concludes with the famous uh, voice of the Lord asking, whom shall I send and who will go for us? We know this. And of course, Isaiah says, send me, I'll go. But it is significant for us to be reminded that before Isaiah was ever sent anywhere, the coal from the altar touched his lips and purified him before he was sent. We can't get things out of order. If we want to be a people who are sent, we have to be a people who first have come into the presence of the one who is holy, 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 repented, and allowed the Lord to cleanse us in heart, mind, and soul. So, I'm just going to open the altars. Now, I'm not going to wait a very long time. I don't want to draw it out. But if Isaiah, the prophet, was repenting for his lips to be made clean, then I'm wondering, as we've been reminded that God is holy, 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 I'm wondering if there's anything in your heart and life that you need the Lord to take burning coals and touch. You see, one of the reasons why the word holy and holiness has become taboo in our culture today is because it is offensive to the sinful nature in us. God's holiness comes after those things that have taken root in our heart. God's holiness comes after these things that want to keep us in bondage to sin. But God's essence and God's nature wants to come at those things and burn them, uproot them, purge them, cleanse them. It wasn't that David's prayer in Psalm 51, cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be made clean, wash me and I shall be made whiter than snow. Like, Lord, grant me a pure heart and a steadfast spirit. If there is 
part of your sinful flesh and nature that's crying out, no, 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 this isn't possible. You've been dealing with this your whole life. You'll never be free of it. The Lord wants you to know that he stands outside of the things that keep you in uh, captivity and he can free you from it because he's powerful enough to do so and good enough to do so. So, the altars are open. If anyone wants to come and just bring something before the Lord for him to purify, uh, no judgment. No judgment. The altars are open. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. We join in confessing with the seraphim and the four creatures of revelation. We join together in declaring, this is who you are. You are holy, holy, holy. And God, we praise you that you are perfect and that you are above all the things that come at us, all the things that keep us from you. So Lord, our prayer today, my prayer today is not, Lord, help sanctify, help set apart, help make holy other people. Lord, my prayer is, I'm a man of unclean lips. Lord, would you purify me? Would you start in me, start in my heart, Lord? Would you make my heart like yours? Would you make my mouth like yours? Would you help me to see the way that you see? Would you help me to hear the way that you hear? Would you help me to love the way that you love? God, I want you to make me like you. Lord, I just pray for all those who are responding to you at the altar and in their seats. Lord, would you just, would you powerfully break in their life in such measure that they're left singing like Moses after parting the Red Sea, where they're just asking loudly and with joy, who is like my God? For he has set me free and he has cleansed me through and through. And Lord, for those who may hesitate, we just pray that those strongholds, those barriers just be brought down. That Lord, this heart cleansing, being made like you, being made holy, is what they've always desired and longed for. May it be better than they could have ever asked or imagined. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you are holy because we need you to be this more than anything else. We praise your name and we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grace Point, have I told you the truth today? Amen. I love you and I want you to remember the Father delights in you. You are his treasured and special people. It, he just feels warmth every time uh, that you come before him. He delights in you. Go in the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.